All right, cool. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining this afternoon. Uh, another sunny, beautiful day here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, so this afternoon, we have the pleasure of welcoming Gustav Henter, uh, who's coming to us from KTH in Sweden. Uh, so KTH is actually where Gu our, uh, Gustav did his PhD. Uh, before doing a bit of a round, a bit of a tour of uh, postdocs and uh, getting to see some of the world in Edinburgh uh, as well, or Edinburgh, excuse me, um, before ending up back at uh, KTH coming full circle uh, and getting promoted to his current position as an assistant professor in intelligent systems. Um, so Gustav's research, as we're gonna hear a lot more about here today, um, focuses primarily on probabilistic modeling, and uh, machine learning. I'm sure some people here in the, the crowd have heard of these uh, topics. Uh, so a lot of Gunter's work is on uh, statistical speech synthesis, um, as well as uh, some things that we're gonna hear about, it looks like today, on uh, motion and gesture, so modeling motion and gesture. Um, so yeah, it should be pretty broadly uh, applicable and hopefully interesting to, to this diverse crowd. Uh, things from, uh, it looks like we have some people in the crowd from the uh, Language Technologies Institute, obviously uh, hosting this here in RI. So yeah, looking very forward to a hopefully very interesting talk. Um, Gustav, thank you uh, for joining us. And yeah, without further ado. Thank you so much for the introduction, Matthew. And thank you for having me here. And it's a pleasure to see so many people in, in the audience. So um, uh, I've uh, then, uh, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, presenting uh, to you uh, some of the stuff that we've done uh, recently. And when I say we, uh, it involves uh, a lot of different people. I wouldn't be anywhere without uh, my collaborators. So I want to thank those here up front before we get started. Um, but then there was sort of this tour that Matthew already took you through, which took me to on various exchanges around the world and to Edinburgh and Japan, and eventually then back to KTH where I'm an assistant professor since last year. Um, and sort of if we look at my research interests, I would say, you know, I'm interested, I think I'm interested in probabilistic models describing uncertainty and things like that and machine learning on the sort of the uh, theory or the more um, heavy side. And then it comes to applications, you know, I'm really interested in speech and motion and things like that. I think it's so cool that I can, you know, uh, I can write down some mathematics or whatever, and then I can ask it to speak or move and I can see what happens. So it's a nice meeting of something that's concrete and abstract. And I really enjoy that. Now, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to go a bit fast. Uh, in order to make it a 45 minutes. And on top of that, um, I uh, don't know how good the quality of the, uh, the videos will be since it's transmitted so far. So uh, believe, trust me that they're smooth on my computer at least. Okay, so um, I'm going to state my take home message already here so that you remember. So the basic idea here is that we want to do automated character animation. Which, and that, I think that's a challenging and interesting problem. And uh, I hope you think so too. And we want to do it probabilistically. And in particular, I'm going to present a new probabilistic model for this, uh, which combines autoregression and normalizing flows and is able to reach a state of the art in a number of different applications, which I think is really neat. And at the end, we're sort of looking to the potential for this to merge things like speech generation with behavior of nonverbal uh, or the generation of nonverbal behavior as well. So here's a graphical overview of the talk. We have sort of the, the, the theory bits on the left and then different applications on the right. And the little boxes are sort of a techniques or models that will we'll, uh, visit most of these and combine them doing this talk. So first, uh, motion and why do we want this? Why do we need character animation? Well, if you're playing a video game, then there's a need to animate characters. If you're making animated films, obviously, or special effects, uh, architecture visualizations, where you want uh, humans moving around. And if you have a virtual avatar or social robot, it has a body and needs something to do with it. Um, so when you're creating 3D animation, it's actually quite a complex process. First, you have to decide and plan the kind of motion that you want and how you're going to get it. And then you uh, either do motion capture in a studio to get the motion or even worse, or even more annoying, you know, keyframe the motion and then you have to may maybe manually in between it or, or add all the frames of animation. And then if something doesn't matter or that doesn't work or you stitch things together and they, they don't fit or, or you need a different character and you need to retarget things. You know, it's a lot of work. It, ta it takes a lot of time. Uh, it's expensive because lots of different people with different expertise, expertise are involved and they all have to coordinate. And if something goes wrong and you want to redo something, it's really rigid and takes a long time. 
Um, so here's an example of a um, time lapse of a character um, or uh, an animator creating a single step uh, of, of, of uh, walking animation. Now you can see that there's, you know, there's a lot of expertise involved in, in manipulating these programs and it's a lot of work. Um, so uh, wouldn't it be nice if you could just you know, sketch out the path uh, in the computer and then uh, an AI or machine learning was basically going to generate motion along that path for you. Or for that matter, you can make your dog uh, move the way you want, like you were a director in a film that those dogs are otherwise notoriously difficult for that. Or maybe you have some, some speech recorded for a game and you want the character to gesticulate to it, like in this example. It's kind of stuff. Um, so like it's it's kind of a fun play where like both both of the characters have their own like it's really clear that they're just stupid kids through the, like the whole. I don't know where the music is coming from, but maybe we should. Yes, good. No. Oh, uh... Yes. So can somebody mute them where the music is coming from, please? Yes. OK, uh, because I want to add some other music. So what happens if we then put music instead and we want motion to it? Uh, and we could get something like this. Sorry. Uh, uh, so, anyways, um, uh, so uh, in this talk, uh, so, so uh, uh, right. So those were all examples generated by our methods. So what we want to look at now is uh, start out by probabilistic models. Why do we want to be probabilistic when we describe motion? Um, so it's because there's more than one. Uh, there's no true one true way to move, and there's more than one way to, to generate a natural motion. If you ask somebody to make the same to move in the same way, it's never actually gonna come out the same way twice. So we want to be able to capture that somehow. So let's let's assume that there's some sort of distribution to reality and we have some sort of deterministic model of this, which like like a point mass here, and they don't look the same and you can easily tell them apart. I mean, you could put the point mass in a better place maybe to make it more like the other thing, but ultimately it's, it's easy to tell these things apart, you know, like in a game, if you have canned speech, you know, you're gonna recognize that one sample when you've heard it 50 times, you know, it's, it's not realistic anymore. Uh, now, uh, sometimes there's certain behavior can be more uh, more narrow and more, more well defined, and then maybe then a deterministic model might work. But you can still actually always tell them apart unless reality is is non completely non stochastic. Okay, um, so in a particular deterministic model that people use, usually use or loss function that they usually use is mean square error. And we can understand that, dig into the mathematics a bit further, and we can realize that, that minimizing that is the same as basically predicting the average motion given the, the, the input. So you basically get the average uh, pose or whatever of all the different things you could have done. And this is called mean collapse or regression to the mean is sometimes used, and those sound bad, and it's because they generate bad motion. So here's a motivating example of what I'm thinking of here, like, like a throw of a dime. Um, so uh, what is the average value of this throw? Well, it's the number between one and six. And that number is actually three and a half. Now, where on the die do you have a 3.5, right? There's no side with 3.5 pips. Uh, the only thing that has a three and a point and a five is the edge in the center of this picture. Um, uh, so, and then here's another example from speech synthesis. So on the left, basically we have inaccurate models and we're stepping up to more and more accurate models on the right. And this is some work I did in 2014, where we're basically able to simulate models that were more accurate than we had available at the time. And we could see that if I have a really bad model, the mean is actually a good thing to generate because everything else will be worse. But if you start, if you sample from the model and you get a better and better model, eventually the samples will overtake it and the mean can never be truly natural. And so we pointed out in this paper a number of things that, that needed to be resolved in order for speech synthesis to advance. And then two years later, DeepMind comes out along with a paper that changes those things that we point out. Uh, it's called WaveNet. And then it, it, it and they, now that, and that model they, they sample from and get better results, basically. So we were able to predict that two years in advance. Uh, anyways, uh, here's a uh, geometric intuition of what's going on here. So in high dimensions, you know, most of the possible poses that you can have are just not natural. So the data usually sits on some low dimensional manifold in high dimensions. And then maybe you have some additional information about what motion is going on right now or something like that. So that defines maybe a narrow interval here. And then the conditional mean in a space like this is the center of gravity of this little segment. So that's something like this. So this is okay. Um, but let's say that you don't know what's going on in the motion and you have more uncertainty. Well, then the average, it looks, it looks more like this. The center of gravity is far removed from, from uh, this surface and it's not natural at all. So it can be really noticeably natural. 
And um, the, this, these different situations occur in different areas of motion generation. Like when you're generating lip motion, that is quite predictable from speech audio. So the deterministic model might work well. When it comes to locomotion, if you just tell somebody what path to walk, you don't know if they're going to start with the left or right leg, for instance. You can get very different motion, and uh, averaging will, will look really bad. But if you have additional information, like the, the phase of, of the psychic locomotion or where you're going to put the feet, um, then actually it's highly predictable and a deterministic model can work and that has been the previous approaches to that problem so in this case uh, or uh, but uh, an even more difficult cases is, is the kind of stuff that i do now so gesturing with my hands and head and uh, the stands in conversation and all those crazy things it's just not well determined by the speech that you're you're emitting and there is really no way of predicting that you need to be probabilistic so here we have an example on the left of a um uh, deterministic approach, so we minimize the mean square error of moving in the circle, and we see it, we basically just get the average pose floating around. And on the right, we have a sample from our model, Moglo, and we can see that that looks, uh, that generates natural motion. Um, so now I'll introduce to you the normalizing, normalizing flows, which are basically the, the thing that powers the methods that we're working on. And when we have a probabilistic, or when we want to think about the probabilistic method, there are three things we want for it, we, we, from it. We want to be able to uh, train it uh, in a good way. So if you compute probabilities, we can do maximum likelihood estimation and, and training. That's really nice. We want to be able to generate output efficiently like, like, like from, by sampling. And we want it to be flexible, right? The, the set of different distributions that this can represent, the parametric family, needs to cover, include distributions that are similar to what we actually want to have out. Otherwise, we can never get good quality. Uh, so we need a, a rich parametric family. So here I'm going to try to look at some classical and more modern approaches to this problem and see wh where their strengths and weaknesses are. And at the bottom, I have sort of a structure here. So this is sort of the input, the conditioning. This is sort of the output variable. And then there's some sort of network that transforms this. And some models also have a latent variable that we'll talk about. Um, and here I've uh, sort of I've added a little Gaussian here to, to symbolize that we're adding Gaussian noise here. So maybe we have a mean or something here, and we're adding Gaussian noise. And uh, there will be Gaussians in various places on these boxes. So this is basically the simple, uh, simplest case is when you, you, you know, predict the properties of something like a Gaussian directly from uh, the conditioning input. And it turns out that that's basically what you saw before. And then the Gaussian adds noise on top. So basically like, like somebody's you know, floating around the circle and being noisy at the same time. This is terrible. So even though it's easy to train and fast to sample from, it's just not flexible enough. People haven't gotten good results with this really. Um, OK, so we can add a latent variable to this that, that uh, can describe additional uh, variation, maybe a discrete latent variable. Then we get something like a mixture density network. Um, and these kinds of things have been around for several decades. And people have tried them. And they still don't give sufficiently natural motion. So this is just not good enough of a model. Now, a variation autoencoder, on the other hand, it is more interesting. It has lots of different uh, value, values in the latent space, a continuous distribution that is mapped non-linearly to some, some potentially interesting distribution in the output that can be complex and non-Gaussian. Uh, non and then we add Gaussian noise uh, as required to, 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 for the final bit. So to, but unfortunately, VAEs, uh, you can't maximize the likelihood. You have to have a lower bound on that. That might be OK. But they're also sort of and not as flexible as you want. So in practice, there's something that's called posterior collapse. And that's basically the model ends up ignoring the, the latent and ignoring its variability and just relying on adding Gaussian noise to represent variability. And that doesn't have the structure we need. And we're back where we started with these Gaussians that don't really work. GANs, genitive adversarial networks, they work. And why do they work? It's because all of the variation uh, basically, they have to use um, uh, all of the variations sits in the latent space and is nonlinear transformed. And the model has to make, make use of this nonlinear transformation to create a good distribution here that, that might be non Gaussian. And this really works, but it's hard to train. So you can basically, you need to find this equilibrium in a uh, uh, Nash equilibrium in a game. And even if you think you're moving towards this all the time, you can actually end up going, going in a circle when you optimize this. So this is basically really difficult to work with, but can give good results. And what normalizing flows do is they sort of change this generator network here to an invertible neural network. So now you can go back and forth between the two spaces. And it turns out this is what you need to compute likelihoods in a model like this. And then you can do monotonic maximum likelihood training, which is really useful. Um, so that's the key idea of normalizing flows, basically, is to have an in invertible transformation f. And then you can use the change of variables formula to compute the uh, likelihood in terms of uh, you know, the, the value in the z space and this uh, log uh, absolute determinant of the Jacobian. And then even if f is a weak transformation, 
transformation, you could do the same trick as the neural networks. You chain together many weakly nonlinear transformations to get one big, uh, strongly nonlinear transformation from, say, a Gaussian distribution to something more, inner, more interesting. And this is the same idea that we use to generate samples and guns that really works. But here's an, uh, another way of viewing this. It's like you're baking, but your dough is probability mass. So what can you do when you're baking? Well, you can rotate the dough. Um, and you can move the dough around, you can translate it in space, uh, you can let the dough rise, or maybe you can compress it back together again, so you can change the, the volume of it, and you can also, um, uh, and these models that we normally have also, they allow you to say globally shrink or, or uh, you know, compress or stretch this distribution, but that's where most models stop. Normalizing flows, they give you access to more nonlinear ways, additional nonlinear ways to need and transform this probability dough. So we might flatten it in one, certain places, but on others using a rolling pin. Uh, we can, you know, can twist it. We can put kinks in it. We can make many other changes to make make the shape uh, or the density match the density that we're, the, the the shape that we needed to have basically. So here's a, an animated example of, of uh, a normalizing flow in 2D. So we have a Gaussian distribution on the uh, the, the left. We want it to look like two crescent moons on the right. And using coordinate wise, nonlinear but invertible transformations uh, in sequence, as you see, we can, uh, this, it's possible to, to create this transformation and get a really good um, example of those two moons. But that's not the example that made me re uh, really be interested in this. It's when I saw this. So, this uh, is a model called Glow that was generating faces. And this is the first example I saw of uh, really re realistic faces being generated by. A likelihood-based model. I was instantly interested in this and how this worked. Um, and here, uh, so now I'll try to describe to you what this GLOW network looks like in, in, inside. So basically, I have a number of these flow steps, and each one of them has three sub-steps. The first one of them is just basically a replacement for ACT norm. It's like an element-wise affine transformation that's initialized in a special way. And then you have a linear transformation, like a matrix multiplication, basically, or a one by one convolution, they say. Um, anyways, but the, the point of this is just to, to change the order of things, permute things a bit, mix things a bit. Um, and that's necessary because of the secret source in, source in the coupling layer, because that one sort of nonlinear transforms half of the variables uh, based on the other half. And in a way that can be inverted. And uh, you use a neural network to compute these transformations. So therefore, it can be very powerful and non uh, strongly nonlinear in smart ways. So here's how it works. Basically, you have uh, an input vector uh, B and an output vector Z. Each one of these is split into the lower half and the upper half of the elements. And the lower half of the elements, we just pass them through without changing. The upper half of the elements, we add a offset to each element and uh, multiply each element by a non-zero scaling factor. And these ones we come up with by feeding the untransformed elements into a neural network that predicts uh, the, these values. Um, and then if we want to invert this, that's also very easy actually. We just, you know, these two are just the identity transformation, just put Z back into B. And when here we need to do a division and a subtraction, uh, with an S is non-zero, so that's going to work. And the way to do it is we just feed the same values as before into the network, and I would compute the right values that we need to undo, basically. So this is, is easy to use. And all of these things are needed in some sense. The activation normalization is important for initialization. Otherwise, the network might not, not learn at all. Um, the linear transformations, <clears throat> if we don't have them, we don't mix the numbers. So half of the, the output, basically the lower ones, will just be Gaussian. There would just be Gaussian noise in the output. So we don't really get the, the advantages we want. But if we instead we remove the coupling layer, then everything just boils down, collapses down to a single affine uh, transformation. And that's not what we want either. So we need this interleaved mixing and affine couplings. Uh, anyways, so what are the advantages of this? We can compute likelihoods and we can even optimize those using gradient based methods, which we like in deep learning. Uh, it's equally fast in both directions, actually, both to compute likelihoods or to sample when we do that. Disadvantages include the fact that this has to be invertible. So we need the latent sort of space or the base space to have the same dimensionality as the uh, observations. GANs can be much smaller and still work, sort of. But we can sort of get around that by making the, the, this, um, the transformation. Uh, different levels of depth for different Z values, basically. So it can sort of be broad near the, uh, near the image or whatever domain and maybe much narrower later on. And this reduces the amount of computation. And then finally, we need lots of parameters because um, these transformations are invertible, so they're a bit weaker than the general ones that we have in a normal network. But on top of that, each one of them contains a neural network. So there are lots of parameters involved. But um, I often say that it's easier to make uh, a good model fast 
than it is to make a fast model good. And our goal here was to basically actually generate good motion. And here is uh, the first paper that I introduced to you called Moglo, which is, it was a preprint that uh, for a long time they published in 2019. It was uh, finally appeared at SIGGRAPH Asia this uh, or last year. Um, and what we want to do here then is to generate a sequence of poses, poses that's motion using a normalizing flow. So we feed in some, some random noise and this is reshaped into uh, the output we want. But motion needs to be continuous. So we need to look at the previous poses and make sure that the next pose is consistent with these or its distribution is consistent with those. So we need autoregression. That's uh, what we're gonna use. And we need some way basically of making the normalizing flow listen to this autoregression and depend on it. So now we have this uh, conditioning information C that is an input to, to blow somehow. And what we do is we put it into an affine coupling layer and specifically as an input to the affine, uh, the network here. So now the, we need C and then we can transform X to Z and vice versa. And this transformation is highly nonlinear and depends on, on both inputs. Uh, so this, this can be really powerful. Uh, okay, and then when we want to generate output, we just apply sort of this sampling procedure sequentially, sliding the thing along uh, the, as required for autoregression, basically. And then actually what we did was also put a hidden state in here, deterministic hidden state. So basically we put LSTMs in that network A in the coupling in the network in the coupling layer and uh, this helped with uh, stabilizing the motion so on the left we have without it and notice what happens to the legs here it's sort of the, the the length of the bone changes and it goes goes haywire basically and numerically unstable and if we add this it stabilizes the autoregression for some reason because autoregressions can be un uh, unstable but it's stable with the lstms um okay but now we have just an um, an unconditional model of motion. So this would just move on its own. We want to control the motion. So we need, we have some additional inputs for every frame that tells us what we want the motion to do then. I mean, it might be the same for every frame if it's, it's some global thing, but we also might want to control it for every frame what it should be doing. And we will need then to feed that also into the flow so you can listen to that. Um, and the way to do that is just basically concatenate the autoregression and the control inputs and feed all of that in uh, as C. Um, but this doesn't really work because the autoregression is so strong. Basically, the next it's so predictive as for what the next pose will look like that the control inputs aren't really listened to when you train the model and they, they have no effect. Um, so what you need is a trick called per, uh, data dropout. So we drop out the poses in the autoregression randomly during training. And this sort of reduces the value, informational value of the autoregression because sometimes the information is gone and therefore boosts the, the relative value of the control input and the, the optimization and the model will listen better to that. Uh, so here without the data dropout, we better we get smooth motion. It just doesn't have anything to do with the way we want with the control input that we have. Um, but if we have data dropout, um, then we get still smooth motion that uh, is consistent with the control and we can actually reduce the dropout rate uh, a lot and still get consistent motion here. Um, and here's the same thing for standing still. Okay, so this is the final architecture um, uh, that we developed. And what are the advantages of this? Well, it's probabilistic, it, it, so it can describe everything that can happen and not just uh, a single thing. It is uh, it has the same structure as GANs, so it's sort of nonlinear transforms noise into the distribution that we want, so it's, and flexible and fast to generate from. And we can compute maximum likelihood, so we can, or probabilities, we can train this using maximum likelihood, which is really neat, uh, efficiently to boot. So um, there are some other advantages, like we notice here, we didn't make any real assumptions about this motion, or even that the data was motion at all. Um, and, and so this is very general. If it works for one thing, it might work for several others. And we can uh, also notice that when we fed the control inputs in, we only took the current one and the previous ones. We didn't cheat sort of and look at, at the future control input. So this can be controlled uh, with no algorithmic latency and would be really responsive, say, if you used in a game. And finally, we get high quality results. And that's, for that, I've got to show you the experiments, basically. So what we looked at first was locomotion synthesis. So basically making these things walk along a path or run or whatever. And locomotion is interesting for several reasons, uh, or mostly because it's so easy for us to see when it doesn't work, you know, if it's jittery or if it slides along like you already saw in those examples. And we can even quantify that, which is somewhat unusual that it's easy to measure the errors or the issues uh, objectively. Um, and for the control signal, we used three numbers as input. So we defined basically the forward displacement uh, be, uh, between frames, the sideways displacement between frames, and sort of the angular displacement. So how much is the character turning? So together, these define a path 
that the character or the root node has to follow. And then the method has to put sort of insert poses along this so that this looks natural. And uh, we're going to visualize the path, uh, uh, the, the control signal input as a blue curve on the ground plane in these videos. So these are the two tasks that we'll be considering, considering uh, motion for humans and for dogs. And uh, for the human data, or uh, at the time when we published this preprint, there was no available method at all that could solve both of these types of different morphologies uh, at the same time with the same type of model. Um, no, or the, it was the first model that could basically do it without making any changes to the model. Um, and for the, the human data, we used uh, some data from Edinburgh and also the uh, CMU graphics motion capture data, yay, and also uh, and another database. And for the dog, it was uh, another data from, from Edinburgh, like half an hour, I believe. Okay, and then we also look at different representations of posts because you can sort of represent the, the, the positions of joints with Cartesian, Cartesian coordinates in 3D space and then you get like a stick figure. But if you want something that, that's skin or that has texture mapping on it, then you need to actually represent the angles and twisting motion and so on of, of the joint. So you need another representation that's not the Euclidean space anymore, but has a more interesting topology. Okay, so we trained these uh, number of different systems, two uh, sort of baselines or one bottom line and one baseline that was task agnostic, and then two state of the art systems. Uh, one of them quaternate state of the art on a human uh, bipedal locomotion and one, the other one uh, motion uh, mode adaptive neural networks state of the art for the dog uh, motion data. And these were, uh, were trained to Moglom models to compare against these. And notice that the more competitive models here, they all look into the future at least one second. So they have an additional information, whereas Moglo has no algorithmic latency and only looks at the control signal now and uh, back in time. And finally, we had some ablations that allow us to look at the effect of this uh, post uh, or data dropout and see how we, if it works. So here we have some example motions to compare, and th these are all for the motion capture of the top. Basically, it follows a certain path, and then the we fed that input path, that path as an input to the other methods and see what we got out. And here's something similar for the dog. Um, so uh, on the right, you have Moglo. Notice how happily the dog is wagging its tail. That's just basically random sampling, I believe. Uh, so this is kind of cool, I thought. And um, uh, here is, are some examples for a smoother controlled signal, the kind of stuff that you might get from a, a game pad if you put it pushing in one direction. And here we see that the, the difference is even bigger and Moglo is the only thing that really works here. And here's a similar thing for the dog data. Check out what Moglo does when it stops. It sort of sniffs around. So this probabilistic framework gives you automatic idle animations as well, which is kind of cool. Um, so this, we also had Quaternet, and that's hard to compare against the others because it has it includes a lot of processing steps that makes it motion different. So it changes the speed of the motion, it changes the path of the motion, it changes the duration of the motion, it changes the camera angle, and it can't walk backwards and sideways. So we didn't modify these aspects because we want to compare against exactly the system that the authors had, basically. But that also means that we couldn't include it in, say, the synthetic uh, data evaluation because it just couldn't do the things that we needed it to do. Um, right, so we evaluated this in an objective way by analyzing footsteps that's reported in the paper and subjectively with a crowdsourced evaluation uh, where we had people rate the animations on a scale from one to five and notice that for all of the examples here and any other thing that we evaluated, there was no foot stabilization, no post processing applied. What all that you see is raw motion output data from the model. So these are the results on the human data and Moglo we can see is uh, very close to natural, the natural scores very close to natural and does not degrade uh, significantly on the synthetic control input. Okay, and here we have uh, a, a, all the, the numbers in a table. I'm and not really going to go through this too much, but basically for, for the human data, we have the held out control input and synthetic control, smooth control input, and the same thing for the dog. Moglo is here. If we compare it to the task agnostic baselines, it's significantly better than all of them. If you compare it to the state of the art for the human, it's very, very close in terms of rating. If we compare it to the state of the art uh, on the dog data, uh, it is not far behind. If we compare it to natural motion, it is very close in one of the examples and uh, a little bit behind in the other. But overall, this is very good showing. And also we see that data dropout is necessary. If you set the dropout to zero, 100, uh, the model gets worse. So that was a really useful trick. Okay, um, that shows that the quality is good, but is it also probabilistic? If we um, generate multiple outputs, can we get uh, meaningfully different output with the same control input? And uh, if we have more diverse data as training data, can we get more diverse output motion? So this we tested on skin characters. 
um, that we trained on two data sets that we used for, for uh, motion capture for video games. And we represented the angles using joint angles. So, so now uh, instead of uh, Cartesian, co uh, Cartesian coordinates as before, and we lowered the dropout rate to 60%. And this is an example of what we get. So you can walk forwards and back or, uh, and turn around, or you could do the same thing with the same input, but now you pretend that you're holding a gun or check this out even hopping locomotion. This is all for the same input. So these are just random things that the model has learned to do for the same input because they're consistent with that input. And here's an input that sort of represents a bit of stumbling motion. And we can notice that if we have diverse data, we can get that kind of crazy behavior. So it's really cool. Um, so what did we learn? Normalizing flow promised a number of things about training, generation, flexibility, all of they deliver on that. We get probabilistic motion modeling that really works. We can describe many different plausible outcomes in one model. On top of this, we can also control it without algorithmic latency. And when we score this, it's close to natural, basically. Even for two completely different morphologies and with different representations of the pose, and it also generalizes well to synthetic motion input. So that's really cool. And then some other side notes is that data dropout is a really effective trick that, that worked in this case. The, the recurrent hidden state stabilized the synthesis for some reason. And uh, we didn't, unlike say GLOW and GPT-3 and lots and lots of, of um, big gun, lots of, of uh, generative models, we didn't have to reduce the temperature to improve visual quality. This is basically just sampling from exactly the same model we trained. And also we did notice that we needed data augmentation to make this work. So in, in addition to lateral mirroring, uh, the problem, uh, the model had problems walking sideways and especially backwards. And by reversing the data in time, we got lots of backward walking data. And then uh, the, that worked out really nicely after that. And the most, for some reason, many of the methods found it most challenging to actually stand still. Um, okay. Uh, now we'll talk about uh, the, where motion intersects with human communication, which is uh, gestures in this case. So uh, you might have noticed that I move around when I talk and I'm not the only one. So here's an example from a database of motion capture and uh, together with speech of somebody gesturing while talking. That because it's just like as awkward as I can possibly be. And that's just the whole thing is just like the entire time. Just um, so, uh, and you might need the, this kind of, of technology, for instance, if you have an, a robot with a body that it needs to do something with, might might be of interest to the Robotics Institute. Or if you have a video game or something, and you want expressive characters that have body language. Um, so uh, how does it work in humans then when we, we gesture? So first we have something we want to communicate, and then this is sort of by an interleaved process transformed into both speech and gesture. And the speech in turn is first, first we formulate words to say, and then we articulate those. Um, and as, but there is a strong relationship between these that, you know, there's in synchrony in some sense. And what we'll do in this case is to ensure that we take the speech and we generate gesture from it. And that way we hope they'll be in synchrony. Um, and in terms of gestures, there are many different types of gestures. I won't go through all of these, but basically some of them express meaning, like we can point at stuff, relate to the meaning of our message. Some of them are just timed with what we say. So there are like, it was called the follow the speech prosody, the rhythm and the emphasis, and they, these are called beats or beat gestures. So those are mostly tied to the speech acoustics. And those are the things that we'll be looking at primarily at generating in this talk. Um, so classically, people have generated a gesture, say by hand and making behavior and then triggering those by some rules. But we're uh, looking at uh, these emerging data driven methods, specifically what happens if we put Moglo into gesture like this. And this is our paper uh, at Eurographics, at Eurographics, which uh, was nominated for a best paper award, which was really cool. And um, so, uh, yes. So there were three things we we're looking at here. Number one is the massive variation in gesture synthesis that rule-based systems can't handle, and that deterministic methods can't really handle either. So we wanted to to try to solve that problem. And then it's a the fact also that that if you just have speech then that's not so much control over the output, but people gesture in different ways. It would be really cool if you could control, say, things that correlate with personality and stuff like that, and also uh, express that. And finally, it's very common that, that gesture synthesis focuses on just the hands or the upper body, but actually we can use our entire body to express ourselves. It would be neat to do that as well. So what we would want for something like this is say, a system where you feed in speech, we randomly sample a few examples of gestures. And uh, if you're making a game or something, I could go like, I want this one, 
or you can go like, I don't like either of them. I pull the handle again. And then you get some other uh, gestures until you have something that's a good starting point for you and going to save you time, basically, if you animate things. And then you want the ability to also make these things as express some style, like a director, you tell it. Now, now do make, like, make small gestures or make fast gestures or big gestures. Now you're really confident. Something like that, you know. Um, uh, okay. And how do we then tie this to how humans produce uh, gestures? So uh, what's important to note here is that so the communicative intent precedes the speech and the gesture in time. And gesture actually needs some planning to be executed properly. You need basically to prepare your stroke so that you can execute it when you want. Um, and in this case, we only have the, the concurrent speech. Um, and we need to still make sure that this planning phase works, that we can prepare the stroke. So the trick that we do is basically we feed in future speech. We get, we sort of have a one second look ahead. So we know what was coming up in the speech and know when to raise our hands so we can synchronize with it. This is basically necessary for this application. Um, and how do we adapt the modal architecture then to speech, uh, to, to, to uh, co-speech gesture generation? Well, the first thing we do is we change the control input to be in this particular case, acoustic features from the speech. And then we do this, uh, include future context as well, and like one second of that. Um, and then if we want style control, we can add additional numbers to these vectors um, that, that represent the style that we want. Okay, and then we applied this uh, in our experiments to the Trinity speech gesture data set. You saw an example of that at, at sort of the start of uh, the, this one guy basically gesturing while talking and that's like four hours of data. Um, and from that we extracted um, male spectrum features um, for, for the acoustics and uh, either 45 or 65 uh, joint rotations corresponding to the upper body or the full body. And then we wanted some style inputs as well, but this database was not annotated with any sort of style. So we uh, settled for sort of a proxy of style, which are certain aspects of the gesticulation that can be measured in the data, like the height of the gesture or, or the speed of the gesture or the radius of the gesture or how symmetric or asymmetric it is. Um, so for the first three of these, what we basically did is we measured this for every frame and then we averaged it over four seconds and then we go sort of, we were now able to sort of control sort of the average height or average radius or speed. And for symmetry, we measured the correlation between the two hands and we then uh, averaged that uh, again over uh, uh, four seconds to get some sort of annotation of the data we could train on. And then here are some examples of uh, speech plus style control input and the gestures that come out of this system. One year somebody's saying one thing and the next year completely changes. Like this is just this is just words. But um, but no, but I think it's it's a big thing that like, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like you can use it for what you like and then like let go of the rest of the stuff. Like that's a big thing. Like because like for me it's like feeling, but let's let's put it into a story and then I'll kind of make it something that it'll kind of help you just like deal with it and all that kind of stuff. Dysfunctional and like they work for each other right now, but that's not necessarily like it's not necessarily a healthy relationship. Or uh, yeah, that this uh, his mother meets this new bloke, and so they start dating. And Kirsty, um, with her stuff at home, by getting her to engage in this fairy tale thing, laughs at him. He just like freaks out, and he's just like, "Stop it! Stop it! I'm not a joke!" Nah, and just gets all like pissy about it. Okay. And now we also want to look at full body gestures. So in this case, what we did is we created two systems. One of them generated its own motion. So basically output these three things that we the, that previously had as control. So the path it moved along, like the forward, backward velocity, sideways and rotation. And the other one instead used um, the, the, what, the path that the character used when, when talking as an input. So we have either uh, uncontrolled that generates its own path or path controlled that, that uh, follows the character of the actor, uh, the path so of the run actor. run away from home and kind of get out of there just because uh, she doesn't like the idea that her dad has kind of like moved on and that she's not needed anymore and all this kind of stuff. Um, so like, it's, it's kind of a fun play where like both, both of the characters, his him and his mother, they'd like make up a fairy tale to uh to say to go um oh well like this is what you're really feeling but let's let's put it into a story and okay 
so we evaluated these systems as well using uh, human subjects because that this is the only reliable way to get uh, to measure the performance of these systems. So similar procedure as before, we evaluated two things, how human like was the motion. So that's basically just does the motion look okay. You can evaluate that without speech. And the other one was how appropriate is the speech for the audio. And here I would say that this, this uh, rating paradigm is not the best. So people confuse this for quality or the human likeness a lot. And uh, it's not really a solved problem exactly how to do this, but but um, uh, we're, we're working towards better ways of evaluating that. Anyways, these are results we got on human likeness. Amoglo scored the best and was significantly better than most um, previous systems. And on appropriateness, it also scored the best and was significantly better than all previous systems. If we applied style control, it didn't really degrade the quality of the motion, uh, which was really nice to see. Um, and so if we summarize what we learned here is that basically the same idea here, Moglo works for gesture generation as well. And not only that, this appears to be a new state of the art in continuous gesture generation. So um, if you are familiar with, with speech or text to speech, you might know what the Blizzard Challenge is basically a big evaluation of speech synthesis systems. So there was a big evaluation last year of gesture synthesis systems. And uh, Moglo placed uh, basically on, on top, there was one other system that was more or less equally good. But uh, so this is basically these State of the art in this area and, and uh, significantly better than what existed before. Um, also, we can control style like we saw without, uh, and we can uh, we can also note from making these models it's hard to tune these. Okay, if the motion is super bad, you can see that, but because it's so random, it's really hard to know if, if you just got lucky this one time or if it really is better. So the only re reliable thing we found was looking at the training set log likelihood. And that's because the validation set log likelihood in our experiment really didn't reflect the visual quality. It basically became, became really bad. So overfitted models look the best. And we think this might be due to the fact that we don't use inverse uh, dropout and data dropout. So the data dropout basically causes the model to not not predict as accurately when we turn it off for some reason. Um, uh, probably the inverse dropout. Anyways, we can reduce this mismatch using uh, importing methods from robust statistics into the flows. And we've uh, published about that uh, at the ICML INNF workshop last year. Okay, uh, now let, let's think about where does all of this fit into human uh, communication then, where uh, gesture and speech together. So um, if we want an embodied agent that both speaks and gestures, we need synthesis of both of these things, speech and gesture. And normally speech synthesis is from somebody reading sentences in a room and the gestures might come from a completely different actor that in motion capture. And normally when we read things, we really don't gesture so much. So not only is, might it be a different person's voice, compared to who's gest gesturing, but also there's different modes of moving. So this, is, this can be incoherent and doesn't really match up in the agents. What we really want is to record speech and motion together and then have a system that generates these together as well, as well because then we'll get coherent behavior for the agent. Um, so to get this working, we need to have speech synthesis as well. And that is also an area that we've been working on recently at KTH. So we were working on spontaneous speech synthesis. Speech synthesis that sounds like it's spoken spontaneously maybe in a conversation, for instance. And here, Eva CK that we see here has been a paper machine. These are just the papers of hers that I've been part of. And she's published even more, basically. So it's been pretty crazy in the last years. And um, I want to highlight especially this one, which won the best demo award at Interspeech 2019. Um, anyways, and we believe it won the best demo award, not necessarily for say the, the signal quality of the speech synthesis, but, but because it was so lifelike when it was trained on spontaneous data. And here I'm gonna show you a comparison. So this is a 24 hour database of audiobooks. So it's read speech, um, that is very standard benchmark in speech synthesis. I'm gonna play that. And then after that, I'm gonna play an example from our uh, spontaneous sounding voice from, from podcast data. And all of these will be for in, input sentences that are found in, in a casual conversation. So they, they should be conversational. Yeah, exactly, definitely. Yeah, exactly, definitely. There was, I mean, you can make wine from anything. There was, I mean, you can make wine from anything. So at least I find the spontaneous ones a lot more convincing. Um, and we sort of in, unintentionally uh, passed the Turing test when several speech people didn't realize they were, they, were, they were listening to synthetic data when we had the demo, so that was fun. Uh, anyways, so now let's, let's try to put these things together. Um, so what we want to do is then uh, generate uh, coherent speech and gesture. So we put together this, this uh, team of different people and published this at uh, Intelligent Virtual Agents last year. And 
uh, as a first step towards merging these two into one box, we use two separate boxes, but trained on basically the, the same data. So the same person, so speech and gestures together. Uh, so we first had text to spontaneous speech and then fed that spontaneous speech into the gesture uh, like, like, like this, right? Um, so we used for the speech synthesis, for the speech, speech people here, we used Talkatron 2. The neural vocoders we had, it didn't sound good on this voice. We used just Griffin Lim, so the voice sounds a bit metallic, uh, perhaps. And then uh, when we got the synthetic spontaneous speech, we fed it into the same system that you already saw before, basically. And uh, here's what comes, what came out. And here I'm actually going to shut up and I'm going to uh, basically... So this is generated from text only, and I'm going to have the system introduce itself instead. Text to speech has come a long way over the recent years. Now it is possible to synthesize speech out of spontaneous conversations instead of like people reading books out loud. At the same time, new gesture synthesis methods can generate very believable animations. Uh, so here is a, just a, a small experiment we did in this paper, um, which uh, where we tried to see if, if uh, the speech and the gesture were, were in, uh, coherent and in sync. So here we have um, natural speech and here we have synthetic speech spectrograms. And we see and 300 samples then from, from, from gesture, we see that so the peak velocity occurs reliably uh, at a certain part of the speech. And that part of the speech changes when we feed other speech in the synthetic speech. So clearly these are, are synchronized with each other. And we can also see that even if we feed in synthetic speech input, we get uh, a broad variety of gestures that are uh, reasonably close to the gesture space occupied by the training data. Um, so what, so to return then, to conclude the talk in some sense, or, or what we've seen so far, we've seen that it's a really cool problem and interesting and challenging to, to generate character automation automatic, uh, automatically. But we, we need probabilistic models for this and Moglo that we've introduced is, uh, is really can do it, right? It works for many different tasks. It generates meaningful random, vari the ma random variation is plausible and meaningful. And we can adjust the amount of algorithmic latency to, fix, to fit the task from zero to as much as we need. And finally, uh, we see that it reaches or surpasses the state of the art in a wide variety of different applications. And we can even use it to start sort of going more and more towards the virtual human where we feed in just something simple as text and we get verbal and nonverbal behavior out at the same time. So the code for these things uh, is online uh, and videos and so on on our respective project homepages. I won't have time to dwell on the slide, unfortunately, um, because I wanted also to mention some other publications we have. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I want to highlight this one, uh, which where we try to also put meaning into the gestures. It's really hard. So I, I think we only very partially succeeded, um, but it was it's an interesting avenue to push that I think is a very relevant uh, research problem. And I think the uh, chairs of ICMI agreed because uh, that one received the best paper award. And then we have this work as well from Intelligent Virtual Agents last year, where we were looking at can we use normalizing flows, so very similar to Moglo, um, to generate um, head motion and facial expression, not lip sync, but facial expression in response, not uh, to in response to a, an interlocutor in an actual conversation, like like you know, nodding, like mimicry, nodding when the other person uh, nods or when you should nod, and things like that. And uh, in fact, that we found that that worked, and this uh, we were very happy. We also received the best paper award at uh, at Intelligent Virtual Agents. So with that, I um, sort of celebrate this with a victory dance generated by our model. Thank you so much for listening, and I will open the floor for questions now. Let's see, I don't hear anyone. Does this mean I went too fast? Alan has, uh, yeah, Alan, Alan, go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, 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 thanks, Gustav. This is very interesting and cool and um, uh, in, impressive. Uh, one of the things you sort of hinted at near the end was the issue of evaluation of gestures and speech. Um, can you say a little bit more from that? I do understand that it's hard, but c can, can we, what, do, what are we going to have to do in order to be able to deal with the fact that we're getting more holistic generation and we already know that even with speech alone it's hard to really look at appropriateness so have you 
thought of anything? So I have uh, I have a couple of ideas here uh, for gesture that I think is going to carry us a bit forward. And we used these in some of our publications as well, like, like that, that uh, Let's Face It paper, for instance, used some of these ideas. So number one is um, use the same thing that we've done in speech before, so like things like mushroom tests, basically parallel evaluations. So instead of sort of putting everything in a random order, say that these are all examples of different systems, you know, for the same speech. And you look at these, go back and forth, rate them on a gradual scale and so on. You get this increases your resolution, basically, of the test. It doesn't get at the problem that you might be measuring the wrong thing. And for that, the trick that we're using right now, which I think is, is, is working, is to use mismatched uh, uh, speech and motion. So you can have a stimulus. Let's, let's say you have two examples here where we've taken speech and we generated motion for them. And so this gives you basically two videos with two different speech tracks. But you could swap the motion between the two. Now that you've totally broken the dependence between the speech and the motion, but the motion has the same quality, right? It's the same motion, you just change the order of it, but it, now it has nothing to do with the speech message. And you can, so you can include these things in your evaluation as well. So you can have this because you, now you have two stimuli that have the same speech, but one of them has motion that's related to the speech and one of them has motion that's statistically independent of the speech. And if you put these in the same evaluation and we did that, uh, that was used in the Let's Face It paper and also used to an extent in, in the, the uh, Genia challenge, so this Blizzard challenge thing, but for gestures basically. And this way we were able to find you know, significant gaps basically. So this, this is really increases the accuracy or measuring uh, appropriateness and we know that we're controlling for motion quality because it's the same motion that you're seeing just in, in a different context. Uh, so that I think is, is the way that we have to start doing this uh, uh, now. Uh, but it's, it's a bit tricky because how well this works depends on the database. So for this particular database, this is sort of a good bad database. So the guy behaves like he was paid by the gesture. So he's crazy gesticulation. He never shuts up. And this creates basically that if we swap the gestures, they actually usually look really good um, because he, most of the stuff is just, uh, you wave around enough and it sort of looks okay. Um, whereas the really interesting areas are when you have intermittent speech. So somebody that's making a lot of motion and then they have to listen for a while and they stop moving. And if you mismatch that, it becomes instantly obvious that the guy is going crazy, you know, and saying nothing or vice versa, you know, talking and just, just sitting like they're doing nothing. Uh, so so uh, it really depends on the database, the efficacy of that tool. Um, and it didn't, in fact, for this database, it wasn't so efficient. And uh, we had that in the Moglo, original Moglo paper, Moglo for gesture paper, paper, the style gestures paper. And it was basically almost no difference. Um, so so it, it, you have to be a bit careful. I think ultimately we have to spend a lot of effort now on the databases that we, that we collect and what we do with them, because I think that's really important for what we can see. And I think that's what's holding back, say, semantic generation as well. We don't have large databases with really, really semantic content. Okay, thank you. I think it's a great question. So thank you for asking. So I got to expound. See a hand up, Julian, go ahead. Yeah, hey, thanks. Very, very interesting. Um, so you know, we're, we are the robotics seminar. So I'm kind of curious about what your thoughts about are uh, so how we can apply this sort of animation style things to kind of animate robots where now it has to be kind of a physically plausible motion it has to be dynamically controllable um but where the data sources are still coming from potentially like an animator or a person Whew. so this is really interesting uh but also something that really haven't considered so i can I, you know i can pull a few things out of thin hair um, and I have no idea how relevant they are. So I, I suspect actually that you guys have a lot better ideas, but I mean, uh, I guess one thing, are there ways to retarget the motion or somehow that it, it satisfies the dynamical constraints of the robot? So then you have a training database that always satisfies these properties and the, these, these models are pretty good at, at, at matching what's in the training database. So then you might get realizable motion. Um, but I truly have to say that I don't have enough experience with robots and with robotics to understand the real problems here. So, so um, uh, perhaps you guys can tell me. What I can say is that I am in a department where people do robots and I just don't do that. I'm, 
I'm not very good with my hands, you see. So anything that involves atoms is basically that that's usually bound to not go so well when I do it. Uh, so that's why I stick to these virtual avatars mostly. Um, so if somebody wants to suggest to me how it should be done, you're more than welcome. But if you want to keep quizzing me on, on, on things that I might have a reasonable answer to, you're also welcome to keep doing that because that was that was too good a question. <laughs> Thank you for saying my question is too good. No, I, I appreciate that. I It's a sort of a different topic, but uh, I still think it's kind of an interesting idea that like these yeah, I won't things be you're doing definitely down. are going yeah. to have some basis in robotics. Like they're definitely going to be relevant. Um, it's not like they're completely disparate and we're just, I think between graphics from what, I, from what I've read, between graphics and robotics, we just haven't quite yet come to that convergence point. So, so I can maybe say that we are working on a project right now where we're putting this type of motion on a robot, but I'm not doing the robots part of it. And in fact, I'm doing very little right now because the, there are too many other good people that are doing all the heavy lifting and it's stuff that I'm not so so strong at anyways. So I, I am not fully aware of how they're doing it, but, but I think we might be seeing that soon. Cool, thanks. And then maybe you, I can send you the paper or something and it will tell you all about it. That'd be cool. Uh, it looks like there's another hand, um, Chaitanya. Hello. We're having a little trouble hearing you. Yes, there's some some problem with the audio, so you're not uh, you're not intelligible on my end. Uh, well, we heard that. That's good. <laughs> oh, is it better now? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay, cool. So yeah, I will probably not ask for gestures because I work on that myself. Uh, and I, I, I understand the problems uh, about evaluation and everything. Um, so uh, my question was more uh, regarding the normalizing flows. Uh, I'm curious, uh, the, the way you say it is able to capture the distribution so well, uh, what would happen if there's a lot of noise in the data set? Um, and uh, how would, would, because it's able to capture uh, the good parts of the data set, will it be capturing the bad parts of the data set? I mean, this, this does the setup that we're using now, right? This is just designed to try to capture what is in the data set. So in that case, yes, it will capture the noise, right? This kind of model is, is you, you can very easily imagine how it would capture Gaussian noise and structure at the same time, for instance. So you're basically going to get then an accurate, I hope, representation of your noisy emotion. So that might not be exactly what you want. But uh, we're seeing more and more that machine learning, because of the power of you know, the unreasonable effectiveness of data and the computation that we now have to deal with that data, create situations where we can get good output out of bad data. And this is something that as, as a synthesis person, you know, this is, is, uh, this is really a break with everything that, that has been understood in that field for a long time, right? You have to have really high quality data, otherwise you get low quality output. Um, but if you look at something like say GPT-3, for instance, it generates really, I, I would say the output is good, but also think about say something like consistency, like spelling. GPT-3 actually spells really well. It doesn't do a lot of spell, spelling mistakes. It's also, you know, th that text generation is actually better than human text, uh, human spelling most of the time, um, is my impression. And th this is an interesting paradox in the sense that it's been trained on data from the internet, which can be bad and often is bad. So for some reason, it is able to leverage this and actually get really good output. And if you look inside, so basically it must mean that the model is, uh, is strong, but there are other things involved as well. So if you look inside the model, then we get to this temperature re reduction. Um, they're not actually sampling from the same distribution that they learned. And you had a paper on this, I believe, also for gestures, right, Chaitanya, where you also were sort of modifying the distribution at sampling time. I had a paper about that. Like, like that was my, my first paper uh, ever was about that topic. It was very different. It was based on information theory. But what they did, what they do in GPT-3, for instance, they use something called nucleus sampling. So they basically figure out which outcomes do I have to include to cover, say, 90% of the possible, possible things that can happen. And then you only sample from those. So you cut off the tails of the distribution because that's where most of the weirdness sits. And it turns out that 
at least in some scenarios, this appears to be sufficient actually to, to sort of cut off more noise than you want. Um, or sorry, sorry, it was completely wrong. Uh, to cut off that noise that you didn't want and get sort of better results than might have been in the database to begin with. So that's one way of doing it. And then there's one other way that I would sort of in, in a more um, principled fashion that I would say, I don't know how it stacks up against the, um, the, uh, the nuclear sampling approach or the temperature reduction approach, um, because I haven't seen it trained on the same size of data, but that's the publication that I had at, at the ICML workshop last year, uh, where we uh, used methods from robust statistics. So this really depends on how the data is corrupted. But say if, if there are localized corruptions in, in the data, um, uh, so, so certain parts of the data are good and certain other parts are bad, then you can actually, there are well-established methods in statistics that tell you with, if you're maximizing, you know, if you're using maximum likelihood or something like that, there are certain ways you can deal with that. And, and we showed basically that you can port these to um, normalizing flows as well. Uh, and you can get what's called a statistically robust model. So basically, so what it does, it basically just learns from the most typical things and it can sort of learn to ignore completely things that are really weird. So that's useful if you have huge outliers, for instance. Um, and and uh, so, so that's obviously I would recommend that solution in, in those scenarios if you have a lot of data and very localized, but, but no uh, large uh, corruptions, then that kind of method is theoretically very appealing and I've published on it. So I recommend it for that reason. <laughs> Thank you for that answer the question very well, thanks. Can I ask a question? Perhaps. Perhaps. There's one more hand up I see. Uh, Zheng Yi, Zen? Yes, yes. Oh, there you go. Thank are. you. Yes, yeah. please so ask a very interesting talk. Uh, I do uh, do uh, work in motion generation, so it's very, very relevant to me. Um, I guess in, in Moglo, so mm -hmm. it's mostly for locomotion from the demo, from the look of it. I And you also mentioned they mostly captured um, the motion that's in a data set. And I remember you, you guys used like three data sets, like CMU mocap and the, is it KIT? I actually, uh, I don't remember the details. But uh, I think it was HDM, I'm just if you uh, like or, a, or I, I forget. Yeah, sorry. I keep going. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, no worries. Um, so if you put like a bigger data set or more diverse set of data set, I'm just wondering how well the model handles the diversity of the motion and uh, for like for tasks like are not lo purely locomotion. So say um, the human is interacting with an object or is doing more uh, Weird stuff with uh, <laughs> like a, is doing a workout. Like so how would how do you think with a bigger, much bigger data set that's not uh, 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 like restricted to locomotion? How would this model hold up? <clears throat> hmm. So I think uh, so. I have a couple of thoughts around this. Number one is I believe in the power of data. I believe that you have if you have enough examples of relevant motion. So I have to have a really large database or enough examples to gener generalize basically. So I have to have a really large database. Um, and if you have the information that you need about things like contact points or whatever, or that, that you know the agent has access to the information that you would expect a human would need in order to plan their motion so that they wouldn't do uh, you know, wouldn't slam into things, which is, this one might not learn if it's not in the database sufficiently and so on and so forth. Yeah, I believe that this could work, uh, right? There might be, you know, so so we are, um, we're doing some work on, on interaction right now with a couple of uh, master students, for instance. Um, so, but I don't know exactly where, where how far that ad, uh, advanced that is and exactly what the findings will be. But I, I am a believer in this method because it's not just for locomotion. So we use the same architecture as you saw, also for the gesture generation. And we've used it, for instance, to generate, um, generate a you know, conductor motion from orchestra music, which is a bit wacky, right? Because normally the conductor is the one that generates the music, but, but it still worked. Um, uh, uh, so we, we've done that, for instance, with the same setup, and we generated a, a couple of other things, uh, not in, in a stock. Yeah, like like the, the let's face it, that's not exactly the same architecture as Moglo, um, but we're still we, we've been able to 
um, uh, generate uh, uh, you know, reasonable output. So I really believe that this is sufficient to describe a very large family of uh, things. I do believe also that maybe it can be made stronger, say, by in integrating physics into it. So making it smarter by, by putting in what, what we know instead of just having a completely data-driven method or, or maybe you could put physics into the, the database instead by putting say augmentation that's based on physics or things like that. That's, that's a very easy, easy sort of affordance or handle that we have to, to tune uh, uh, this thing. Um, uh, so, so I believe it can do it. It's just that, that um, we don't always have the data for it yet and um, we might not have been able to try it on these things yet. Certain hyperparameters might need tuning in certain cases, like we found, you know, for, for very complex types of motion, you might need more, more longer autoregression and, and things like that. Um, does how much of this qu your question have I now addressed, and which other parts did I forget about and should keep addressing? Uh, I think it's great. Uh, I, I was just wondering what's the like the capacity of the model you think uh, it is. I also have like a very tangent question on the uh, uh, evaluation. So you, you did show that uh, it's really good uh, quality motion, but um, something I've always wondered, how well it, how, how will it stand up to, for example, nearest neighbors? Uh, because if you just sample, if you from a control signal or a sequence, and if you just uh, sample a close enough, uh, very realistic motion, it's going to, going to be look re very, very realistic because it's sampled, and uh, I, I guess that will be very good for um, human evaluation. Uh, but yeah, and they say if you have enough big enough database, it would I, I guess that would be probably be the best uh, model. Um, so so the way I the way I view this, which may be right or wrong, is that this is sort of a database extension. So this should probably be able to do anything that's in your database, but you can sort of also do things that aren't in the database because uh, machine learning can generalize. So for that reason, sort of from that philosophical perspective, my argument will be that I think this can do more than nearest neighbors because nearest neighbors doesn't, it, it basically, it doesn't ge it generalize by picking existing exemplars. So it doesn't generate new mo new poses and or new uh, in the same way. That said, there are methods that are based on, on essentially nearest neighbors or ver versions of that like, like uh, Forget what it's called. It's called, ah, uh, but there is this sort of like, like unit selection in speech synthesis, basically. So you select uh, uh, every new frame that you need. I know that that was basically a kinematic demo that I mentioned was developed for that, and the name escapes me because this is not my area of expertise. So unfortunately, if if Simon Alexander Sean, which is you know he has the magic touch, basically, if he would have been here, he's the guy who makes these things actually perform really, really well. And he would know probably, or he might know because he has more experience in this particular field than I do, you know, what kind of database sizes that they use to get good output on that. Um, I mean, we trained on one of their databases, cut down a bit because we didn't want parkour in our case. Um, so I don't really know how it compares. Um, I can say one cool thing about uh, generalization. Let's see if I, I'm able to share this with you. Um, yeah, actually, so this is what Text I need. Text-to-speech has come a long way over the recent years. So for this database, um, when, when at the, or for this example, at the end, we wanted him to stop talking. Um, so what we did is we inserted a number of pause symbols. So basically we have control of a pausing as well. You can insert a symbol into the text that says now make a pause. So at the end, we put two of these together to make sure that he stopped talking. Um, and then what happened then is totally shocked us. Thank you for watching. Please check out our paper for more details. So notice what he's doing. He's walking off stage. And that's because that's exactly what he did when he shut up. He was never quiet in the database. The only time when he stopped talking was when he was over with on the recording sessions and was stepping off stage. So from something, so this is something like 27 episodes or something like that of this. And I don't know in how many of those he actually does this, or, uh, but, but this is suggestive that you can, can learn to you know, uh, generate a behavior with high probability if you've seen uh, 27 examples of it possibly a lot less, we just don't know. So that's sort of a measure of generalization, if you will. Uh, Thank you.
All right, I think we should thank our speaker. Thank you so much. I really would like to thank you for, for having me here and for all the interesting questions. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thanks.